Welcome to the webinar. Today's webinar will be on translating without source text, a hybrid approach between localization and copywriting. My name is Priscilla Charles, and first I'd like to start with a little bit of housekeeping today. The webinar will start in a few moments and will be hosting by Julia Tarditi of Menes, Jerome Selinger, Malgorzata Gembala of Precisely, and Dominica D'Agostino of Vistatech. We'll be hosting a Q&A towards the end of the webinar. In order to ask questions today, simply go to your GoToWebinar panel on your screen, and about halfway down, you'll see a questions box. Simply type your question here, and of course, we'll do our best to answer them in our Q&A. If you're joining us today here live, thanks very much indeed for your time. And if you're listening to this recording, thanks for listening. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Dominica. Thank you so much, Priscilla. And hello, everyone. Uh, it's Dominica Diagostino from Vistatech. Many thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, we have quite a large audience and a fascinating topic. I am very excited to bring this session to you today. And just before we get started, um, let me uh, quickly uh, talk about uh, myself and Vistatech just before I introduce you to our panelists, Julia, Gosha, and Jerome. Um, so, as a director of strategic accounts here at Vistatech, I work directly with some of the world's unique leading brands, supporting them on their global journeys. But I also wear other hats and enjoy my roles as global awareness director with the Think Global Forum and as Lock Lunch ambassador here in Detroit, Michigan. At Vistatech, uh, we have been helping global organizations with their international content strategy for over 20 years, providing business and technology solutions that accelerate their international success. As uh, in these times of um, disruption and home body economy, we are also leading a digital first campaign, supporting global brands with their digital transformation. And now, with no further ado, I would like to introduce you to our fantastic guests. Um, so first of all, we have Julia Terditi. Julia, thank you so much for joining us today. And for those of you who don't know Julia yet, she's a self-defined language geek and a visionary on a mission to change the way companies conceive of and execute localization. Currently head of localization for a London-based fintech company, Moniz, she has spent the past 11 years advising startups on how to unlock the full growth driving potential of global content. It is Julia's interest in neurolinguistics and in the relationship between language and the brain that helped her develop the innovative approach she will talk about today. And that also made her the winner of the Process Innovation Challenge at Lockworld in Portugal in 2019. Our uh, two remaining uh, guest speakers uh, are a strong team from Precisely. Uh, we have Malgojata or Gosha Gambala, who boasts over 10 years of experience in the geographic information system industry. And she's focusing on uh, geo data, data and coordinating quality control in a variety of international projects. Uh, with a great passion for foreign languages and a desire to go global in her professional life, uh, she actually quite recently decided to switch her career and in June 2019 joined the globalization team at Precisely, where she now manages the Engage One portfolio. Joining us as well uh, is Jerome Salinger, head of globalization team at Precisely, uh, who is leading a team of six program managers there. Jerome completed his master's degree in linguistics and computing in Paris, France, and has held a variety of roles in the localization industry over the past 23 years. He was working as a translator, reviewer, localization engineer, and project manager, uh, both on the vendor and client side. Uh, so in order to kick off uh, today's webinar, I will hand over now the presentation to Julia, Julia, over to you. Thank you. Uh, let me know when you can see my screen. I hope that's clear. All good? Right. So thank you for joining us. Um, 
uh, today, uh, translating without source text. Uh, this is a subject that's very um, close to my heart. Uh, I'm Julia, I'm Head of Localization at Meniz, and uh, I just wanted to say a couple of words uh, about Meniz. So we're a mobile money account. We allow our customers to create, uh, open a multi-currency account within minutes from the mobile phone and uh, you know inclusiveness has always been uh, a big uh, um, part of our proposition and uh, we're a little bit unique in our localization challenges in that the vast majority of our audience in the UK for example are non-native uh, English speakers. Um, so localization really lies at the heart of what we do and uh, we started localizing in 2017 back then we only had one language which was English we were active in the UK and one currency which was pounds and now fast forward a few years we're in 13 languages um, 31 countries um, and uh, three currencies but uh, we're very happy to say that we had a four-digit increase um, um, in, um, in, in the active users that we see monthly. So we're very happy about that. Um, but we're not here to talk about Moniz and I wanted to say a little bit how I got to uh, where we are uh, right now and to, to this idea in the first place. And so in, in 2008, as a recent graduate in the field of cross-cultural communication, I was very aware of the pitfalls of using a one-size-fits-all approach for global content. And uh, in my first role as a multilingual copywriter, um, my manager had me writing content in different languages, but there was no concept of target and source. In, in fact, localization was unknown to us. And, um, and, and so at some point, a big translation agency came to pitch and they were like, you can just write content in English and I will translate it for you and it's going to be much faster um, and easier to scale. So we accepted, um, but that's when we started uh, to see a gap opening between how the original English version was converting and how the translations were converting. It was, it was never quite there for as much as uh, we tried uh, different things, which we'll talk about in a minute. So you know, I, I then started to obsess about what makes copywriting different from translation and wondering whether, you know, copywriting, of course, taps into the part of our brain um, that's more creative, but what about translation? Does it do that? And in 2012, I joined a company called Badu, which was at the time um, the fastest growing internet company in the UK. And there was an appetite for innovation. And that's when they allowed me to try um, to launch the first live experiment um, as in the form of an A-B test. We ran a, a few pages of a new website um, in parallel once with the translated, classically translated version and once with this copywritten version whereby a French uh, copywriter would just write their content in French without ever having seen the English. And the difference was substantial. We had a um, sort of like a 3x increase in the conversion when, when you were looking at the copywritten version as opposed to the translated one. So, you know, we tried different iterations of that and then we scaled it further, but it was only in 2014 um, in yet another job that I started to explore the scalability of this and how to make it work without slowing down, uh, you know, the, the delivery pace or without increasing costs um, dramatically. Um, so back to the way our brain works. So we have a creative part of our brains, which is used of course when we create content from scratch you know when we write a novel or a poem or an ad for an ad agency and then we have a logical part of our brain that helps us when we do maths and so on and then I guess what I thought is that the you know the, the source kind of doesn't 
allow the translators to fully tap into the creative part of their brain or doesn't allow them to do it as much as they would otherwise because it, it, it kind of tells the brain that this is a routine task that can be performed without going over to the other area to make it faster and you know and, and, and more cost effective and I think it's fair to say that before going down this route, we tried so many things to um, close this gap between how the original content would convert and the translated ones would. We first started to provide more context in the form of visuals and screenshots to see if it was making a difference and briefs, and but then it just increased costs. And, and then we tried to change translators. In fact, for a moment, we stopped using translators altogether. I, I was making a point of, no, I'm only going to use copyright because I thought that was the issue and then it wasn't, it didn't work. And then we tried to change vendors and we went for another agency and then we had to build a relationship of trust from scratch. And then we changed tools, uh, translation platforms, and uh, then we started to pay translators more because I thought maybe this is the issue and, you know, and the payment being a, a big uh, problem in our industry for translators, um, but that didn't make a, a big difference either. And then I saw, oh, maybe we just need to review the translations more in context and then we increase the QR efforts. But truly none of this ever closed that gap. You know, it had varying degrees of success, but always within the realms of, you know, it was almost people were talking about it as if it was inevitable, like something we have to deal with. English is going to convert well and it's going to be the king and then the translated versions will always uh, be behind. So I think it all goes down to rethinking you know, why do we localize? You know, in the area of machine translation, the idea of courtesy translation is, is dead. So ultimately, why do we localize a product such as uh, ours that many needs? And I think it definitely is down to user experience and localization being a part of this. And in fact, localization as a mindset, as a methodology, is the lesser known sister of UX and definitely taps into this. And then if we see it this way, of course, we have you know, to work on making sure it truly speaks to the audience and to go beyond this straightforward um, translation and, you know, to stop just saying, well, we know English converts better. It's just a fact of life. Um, right. So we're like, let's reimagine the translation word and think about uh, a word where there's no target and no source, right? Because if there is no source, then we don't even have a target. And then it means that all languages are copywritten from scratch. This sounds amazing, right? But how do you do this at scale? And I think, you know, now at Manise, we are truly moving the first steps towards making sure that we can apply this method at scale in a meaningful way. Um, the, the step one and the first thing that we need to talk about is, I call it the fight, which is you know, making sure that people internally, your colleagues, understand the importance of this and are on board. And it's it all goes down to debunking a few myths, in fact, because people are going to get people are reticent to change in you know, anyways, and then stakeholders and people that represent you know your your closest dependencies will n you know not want to move to the new approach unless there clearly is a benefit. So finance will go it's going to cost a fortune and I can, I can already hear them talk and then product is going to say this is going to take too long and what about my release it's you know it's it's going to drag things further um marketing is going to go oh this is not going to work because the brand voice is going to be lost if all the translators can create the content without sticking to what the original says and design will say, well, it's, it could break the designs and the layout. And then how do we know if the screen still looks nice? This is a no-go. Development may go, this is not compatible with continuous development. And then it's going to take too long. And QA will say, it's going to cause more bugs and then more truncations. And then it's going to increase our workload. And ultimately, your vendors and your technology provider will say that it cannot be done 
with existing tools. And I'm happy to say that none of those things are actually true. Um, for us, and I think for everyone, this needs to start with design. So when, within your the app where the designers prepare the visuals for the developers, um, localization managers need to have an account and to be able to remove the English and replace it with functional descriptions of every textual element. We call this the brief. And we try to templatize it in a way that we have very consistent usage of this, right? So the idea is we will have all the titles, we'll start with title, column, whatever, and then CTA, column, whatever. And then if, if these are consistent in time, it will mean that first the localizers always know to keep consistency in the way these are localized, but also that we can we think we can leverage things like even translation memory just because of the consistency of the brief structure. And uh, ultimately, if we rename the keys, you know, all the textual elements using keys that then the developers will be happy to use, we could then push this content through to the same translation project, you know, translation platform that then developers would pull from. And so we save a lot of time because localization is brought upstream and can start much earlier than it would otherwise. And so using a plugin, um, you would submit your translations. And the good thing is that you could import your translations back into the design tool once they're finished and to sort of do like a like a QA and anti-development, right? Because you could uncover truncations and overlaps and, and correct them way earlier than developers get actually to, you know, to, to down to work on the screen, cutting dramatically developers time and QA time to uncover and fix those issues. Um, there is a new language that's needed for this, and it's a total backend language. We started to experiment with this when I was at Badu, and uh, we call this master, right? It's, it's a language that's for your eyes only, and it replaces English in its function um, of, of being the source of translation, the source of information that the translators need in order to perform uh, the writing of their language versions, right? And what happens to English? English becomes just another language. And in fact, the English copywriters can work within the translation tools, which makes them benefit from a set of tools that generally is only reserved for translators, right? Copywriters just work in Google Docs or and the designs themselves, but here they could benefit from loads of features that otherwise are only reserved for translators, and, and we think it's a, sh it's a shame. <coughs> so this is inside our um, capsule. As you see, this, uh, the, the master at the top is taking the place of English. And the designs, the visual context, because it's pulled directly from um, the design tool via the plugin, then it's also devoid of English copies. So there's no risk of being exposed to English and being influenced by it just by looking at the visual, um, visual context. And then everything else is exactly the same. And in fact, you know, you, you can benefit from uh, character count limitations by sending them to a max um, and, and all the other features that you, you would in, uh, as if you were working with the traditional uh, English source. So I don't know how many of you are Italian. Typically, there's loads of Italians in um, localization, uh, me being one of them. But um, I just wanted to show you our card ordering uh, screen at Manise done is, um, with the traditional, within a trans traditional uh, source um, scenario and uh, with no source. And uh, I think, you know, you could say none of this is wrong. Um, you know, in fact, option A is perfectly grammatical and uh, you, you can't pinpoint any mistakes, but option B is definitely better. Um, and in fact, it's not just uh, shorter, which means the concerns of design, um, you know, with regards to this is going to break the layout and so on are, uh, are non-existent, but also it reads much better. You know, it, this looks like 
this is an Italian product that has never seen uh, the the you know the go to localization if you want. So it's it's as if English never existed in the first place, which is in fact what localization should be about. And ultimately, this is going to convert much better because it focuses on the CTA in a way that truly talks to to the users. Um, so what could we say uh, as, a, as a way of, um, of our conclusion here? Well, there's a few must-haves and things you need to take into account if you want to go down this route. And the first of which is you need to be ready to test. Um, you know, test, test, test until you've got something that you're happy with and it may not work the first time around. Um, you need to have everybody on board super important, design is to be on board, uh, um, developers need to be on board, copywriters need to be on board, translators need to be on board, you know, not everybody is happy with this the first time around or happy to try it. Um, and ultimately, you need to do your math because you need to go, you need to know where you're headed, what you want to get out of it, and uh, you need to be able to A-B test and report back the test results and 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 really truly to tell yourself is this working because it may not be uh, and uh, I think if you know for the localization managers here you need to stop to pay people per word this is something that I've been a, a firm advocate of um, you know paying translators for their time as opposed to per word because not just you know if, if you pay per word then you're gonna have um, you know, end up paying very little money for a very important button uh, for your funnel that says pay now. And then you're going to end up paying way more for a small print text in the footer of an email that nobody's ever going to read unless they want to unsubscribe. This is what happens when you pay translators per word. And in fact, we always pay them per hour. But when, you know, at the end of the month, when everybody has sent their invoices, uh, we boil it down to a per word cost just to see if we're in line. And our per word cost is lower than it would be if we paid people Per word, but ultimately we think we get much better value out of our translators. Um, and then you need to be able to prioritize your content because this is going to be an overkill for certain types of content and ultimately it's worth it only for the stuff that's truly meaningful and impactful uh, in a pivotal in your funnel because it does have an overhead in project management. We've estimated it at around 20%. So it does, you know, to be worth it, it needs to be content that's going to have an impact. And you need to be able to accept setbacks. And, you know, this is not going to work the first time around, like we said, but it may not work. It may not be doable with the teams you have, with the tools you have, or with the products that you're localizing. And, uh, I think it's important in this respect to 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 say that you, you need to compromise. You know, maybe this is not maybe going source free is not for you. But how about bringing in a source free translation as as an exercise, as a training for your translators, for them to feel more at ease and more confident in working on on content without relying heavily on source. You know, it's 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 a training and I think it could help anyone. Um, and with regards to Manis personally, for us, the next steps are to, to incorporate the approach in, in all the important steps in the funnel where we think this is going to have the biggest impact. And we're going to help more of our translators shift confidently to this source free scenario because not everyone is you know ultimately already ready to 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 take that step and we plan to introduce more machine translation um, for the low priority content so that we can unlock resources and budget in time for the content that we're gonna localize source free and that we think will truly make an impact and that's it. This is me. Uh, again, uh, please stay in touch. This is uh, something that's very dear to me. And if any of you wants to discuss it further, uh, to just have a chat as to whether it, this is for them or uh, how it came along, uh, please get in touch.
Thank you so much, Julia. That was truly inspiring. And uh, I know that we will have a Q&A session afterwards. We tried to prepare ample time for that. Uh, but uh, now let me hand over to Jerome and uh, Gosha for another presentation. Thank you, Dominica. Um, well, thank you, Julia. That was truly outstanding. Really, we have opportunity to discuss this in details, but this is truly amazing, honestly. Um, Gosha, I think you have the slides. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'll give a brief presentation of the company. Um, we've just been rebranded precisely um, not longer than a month ago, and we are a company uh, created from the merger of two other companies, Pitnibo Software, which we come from, and SyncSort. And in a nutshell, we're a data integrity software company. Our mission is to make sure that our customers' data is accurate and consistent. We also enrich the data. So we have a vast portfolio of products that allow us to integrate the data uh, from old IBM mainframes to the cloud, for instance. Uh, we also verify the data. We do deduplication and we also enrich it, enrich it. And we also throw location intelligence too into the mix and provide multi-channel platform software to distribute this data through personalized videos, chatbots, mobile, and Last but not least, we sell our products in 100 different countries. So we are truly an international company. So we're, we're very much engaged with the whole business altogether. And um, I'm the globalization lead in this team and um, I have the pleasure to lead them. And um, Gosha is part of the team and I'll leave the floor to her. She'll give her a presentation about how we, um, we work on this initiative. Thank you, Gosha. Thank you, Jerome. Hello, everybody. Uh, what I'm going to present is a real life example of a globalization challenge we faced uh, last year. And it presents a popular user interface element that probably everybody knows from different applications. And a uh, few words about the software product for which I support globalization. And this uh, particular component uh, is an example from this uh, software. So, and this one compose is an application uh, localized uh, into four languages. It's German, Spanish, French, and uh, French for Canada. And uh, this project family manages personal, personalized communication. Uh, it helps to create seamless and omnichannel communication and uh, it's on any medium and any time and it can be for example an email, uh, SMS, a video, a uh, chatbot or a traditional letter. Um, so what obstacles we faced and how we dealt with uh, localization for this uh, user interface component and uh, how exactly the component I'm thinking about looks like. Um, you will find out, but uh, first uh, let me show you uh, by giving a couple of examples uh, the common problems in software translation. Uh, so, firstly, there are space constraints. Uh, usually, translated text is longer than the English source text. Um, another problem uh, is with an exact, exact translation. Uh, let's take, for example, a word right, uh, one word and three meanings. You are right, make a right turn at the light, or access to clean water is a basic human right. Um, and um, definitely lack of context is a problem. Um, what the translators see is um, actually only strings with text and there is no context at all. In this example, there are only uh, two short strings on and off to work, but a user interface can be much more complicated. Uh, yeah, so let's go to the story. It actually all started with two hard-coded strings. And uh, when one of my colleagues was reviewing the German version of uh, the user interface, 
Uh, he noticed that uh, there, there are untranslated uh, English words in uh, one of the components. Uh, the components is a slider used to activate and deactivate a function in an application. Um, this is how it looks like. Uh, in the uh, German target language, there, there were uh, English words. Um, yes, and you can see this slider finally I am talking about today. Um, and when strings are hard for that, it is usually an um, easy task to, to, to do by just uh, to, to fix it by just uh, asking the developers to externalize the files and uh, then provide uh, translations uh, for, for the string. But uh, not in this case. Um, this this time it wasn't so simple because uh, uh, it appeared that translation would be much longer and not necessarily fit uh, into the slider. Uh, the slider is not responsive, um, and also deleting the text or uh, completely uh, or replace or placing this. Uh, outside uh, the text outside the slider uh, was also not recommended uh, by the user experience team because of accessibility reasons. Uh, it is actually a very tricky user interface component, the slider. Uh, and after a long discussion among teams, uh, the conclusion was that the best solution is to uh, get translations for on and off with a limit of four characters maximum of a word. Um, and this would fit uh, into the slider. Uh, so uh, for providing translations, uh, we uh, asked our in-country viewers who are native speakers um, of a particular language, but also they uh, know the products well. Um, and um, also, my team, as usually, the globalization team, as uh, always, uh, was very supportive. And after uh, exchanging ideas and dis uh, discussing uh, different options, the final translations were ready and applied. Um, so here you can see the translations for the four target languages. Uh, for German, Ein House, that was uh, the exact translation of on and off. Here we can see it, uh, a screenshot from the uh, application. For French, both for France and Canada, it was oui and no, which is actually yes and no. And for Spanish, it was uh, on off. So uh, in this case, uh, the English version has been left uh, because of the space constraints, uh, and this option was considered as undependent, but clearly understood by Spanish language users. And this is where the story could finish. We got translations, we, we, we were able to implement it. But this is actually where the story begins. Uh, because here comes the translation without source text, a Juliet approach introduced last year. And yeah, so why if we never said the translators what the source text uh, is in this slider? So I started to work on the research and ask our linguistic partners uh, to support me in this project. They agreed. And um, what I prepared for translations were two standard size pages of task instruction where uh, I also pasted a few screenshots and I, I also attached an answer sheet. Um, and the answer required only two words in particular language, but the instruction uh, had to be clear and descriptive, but at the same time not too long. Uh, so um, I started with an introductory part where I gave the information about the innovative method 
and uh, that the task will give the context only, no uh, source text. And um, that it was there was one important uh, information to cover uh, that this uh, words shouldn't be longer than four characters. So the, the, the limit was an important uh, information. And in the screenshots, I just showed the place where the translated uh, text should should appear, and uh, I removed the text from the slider. Um, I added also screenshots from the application to better present the UI context. In the meantime, I, of course, I asked some of my colleagues for feedback. Um, so altogether, it took me about three, four hours to work on it. Mm, yeah. And um, results. Um, I remember that I was very thrilled when I got the answers from our vendors. I was wondering uh, how different or how similar the translation will be to this one we had it from the traditional method of translation. And uh, here they are. Uh, in the first row, uh, there are answers from the standard translation method, and below, below you can see uh, the translation uh, without source text. Um, there are different number of answers because uh, not equal number of translators uh, in a particular language participated in this uh, research. Um, but you can see, for example, that for German, uh, almost all answers were the same uh, as for the traditional method. Uh, whereas for the, for the other languages, there were more variations. Mm. And while analyzing the results, I, I took two approaches. Uh, the first approach in which the source text is our, our model for analysis. So we can say that for German and, uh, and Spanish, uh, the, the innovative method uh, was very, very similar or the same. Uh, for French, uh, it was a little bit uh, uh, less, uh, there were a little bit uh, less answer, the same answers, but they all they appeared, the same answers appeared. And this other approach, the, uh, there is no source text approach as the model for analysis. So I took from the other direction and uh, looked at, for example, French language, where uh, in the no source text translation, uh, the winner, so called, would be on off because the majority of answers look like that. So, looking at this traditional standard translation, we and not would somehow fail in this case. Uh, you can see here uh, how the other languages would, uh, would fit into this other approach. Um, and similarly, as Julia said before, there are no uh, right and wrong answers translation in this case. Um, it's very interesting to see how uh, they are similar or different. And uh, what I would like to share are comments from our linguistic partners. Uh, you might be interested how. Uh, people reacted uh, to this kind of experiment. And um, the vendors uh, were very enthusiastic, uh, wanted to cooperate with us, and uh, uh, also this amazing idea and a very interesting innovation, exper uh, innovative experiment. And the translators, um, there was always a comment uh, that this four characters restrictions was a real challenge. Uh, but all in all, uh, everybody thought it's a very interesting approach and uh, uh, especially uh, because of the context given which uh, in software translation is uh, lacking this in software translation is a problem. Uh, conclusion. Um, 
In conclusion, I would uh, show you the pros and cons uh, of uh, this innovative method. I think on the basis of this one particular example I examined. So, cross words are not caged. Uh, translators are free in their um, text, target text. This is definitely a creative method. It's fun for translators. Uh, words to use for specific user interface components. I think the slider is a very good example because it's used in many applications and even if preparation uh, time is uh, long, it really works if there is a good translation that can work for um, many different so software uh, products or uh, applications uh, functions it, it is what uh, going into this direction definitely uh, valuable experience for translators for sure we, we saw the uh, comments from them and cons preparation time um, not scalable for complex user interfaces uh, and restriction for complex types. So I, I couldn't imagine to apply it for uh, documentation or marketing uh, document. But maybe Julia will find out the solution for it as well. Uh, that would be all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kosha. Thank you. That was very eye-opening, and I think that all the self-proclaimed language geeks <laughs> were very happy <laughs> listening to your to all the data and your presentation. Um, yeah, and a, a little bit, I think, listening both, you know, to Julia's and and to yours and Jerome um, kind of research project, it took me back a little bit to my previous experiences um, managing a software localization projects, for example, for an automotive company at the time. And it required localizing a graphical user interface and voice commands. Uh, it was for their in-car in information and entertainment system. So it was a huge project into 26 languages. And at the time, uh, we thought we selected the best translators for the job, very experienced. Um, and yet, it seemed like we were just hitting the wall. Uh, the most glaring example, I think, uh, were the voice commands. Um, our translators were asked to provide several different versions of the text in their native language, and it seemed like they were just so stubbornly sticking to the source text uh, that they had this tunnel vision. And the translations simply were not creative, not natural, and the customer was you know, not satisfied with the number of options that they provided. So, uh, Frankly, you know, we couldn't understand the resentment for this project from the translator's side because it seemed like, you know, it was an opportunity to do something new and creative and exciting, perhaps. Um, but actually, when we got rid of the English source and, hand and prepared the handoff in a very different way for them, uh, Suddenly, you know, we just provided the context and, for example, told them to think about several ways a person in the car can ask, where is the nearest restaurant in your language? And suddenly everything changed. Suddenly their creativity was unleashed. So, Jerome, I, I see that you're nodding your head and I know that you have a background as a freelance translator as well. Uh, what do you think about this approach? Is it something that you think might be scaled and applied to some of the precisely globalization efforts? Well, first, I think that detaching yourself from the source as a translator is really a fantastic approach. I mean, as a user, there's nothing worse than feeling something has been translated and that you're reading the English behind the lines. There's nothing worse than this. So as a translator back in the days, I would have been thrilled because it was always this other blocker that we had to, to wave is that there was always a reviewer or a customer mm. saying that, oh, look, this is not what it said in the source. 
And I would go, yeah, but this is what it actually means. This is what I would have said it. And yes, but it is not what it says. And there will be an inconsistency with the TM and et cetera, and et cetera. So you, you had to go back and just stick to the source. So in the end, I, I had to provide what the customer wanted, which is stick to the source, which leads to another problem, which is um, the percentage by which your translation goes bigger. And for French, it's 30%. 30% more words in French than in English. So when it comes to mobile applications, if there is no strong work done between the UX and globalization team, developers will cram many buttons into one small screen. And when the time comes for translation, it's a nightmare. And if you cannot distantiate from what you have, you cannot get away from the source as it is written, then you have to stick to the words that you have in English. And sometimes it's just horrible. You, you just cannot make this happen. And just to finish on this point, I clearly remember one teacher of mine when I was doing my master's degree, he would give us grades according to how short our French translations were. And he always advocated, no, French can be as short as English, even shorter. Think about it. I'm giving you this constraint. And the more constraints you have, the easier it gets. That was mind boggling at the time. Time, but now I fully understand the point. And having this possibility of getting rid of the source and just understand the concept of what an application is about, what the button is about, what the menu is about, well, you just explain it with your own words. And that's what the translator is about translating an idea into a different language. That's the difference. It's almost like it's a mix of tech writing and translation. Because in tech writing, you're just translating an idea into words. Translation is translating words in a language to another. So I think this approach unleashes definitely what translators are very good at and something that machine translation will never be able to provide, which is creativity. So translators who are listening to me, if you have if you can face this type of project, I mean jump on it. It's, it's gonna be mind blowing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, agreed. And I think it kind of also ties into the trends that we can see in the industry right now that on one hand, we have this extreme automation and AI and, you know, neural machine translation and so on. But then there are those pieces of content that are perhaps very reactive, like, you know, with the current crises and disruptions, the companies are struggling to communicate with their customers and, and making sure that the messaging is right. And, and this content, uh, also, you know, content that calls to action um, requires this tender love and attention that I think machine translation will never be able to provide. Um, yeah, and Julia, uh, you spoke about debunking the myths and fighting the good fight, you know, internally to prove that this approach is scalable and agile. Um, so proportionally, how much content do you really machine translate versus use this uh, no source approach? And um, one additional question I think that came up a lot of times, you know, uh, from our audience in Slido, but also in the chat window now, what type of content is it more su most suited for? Would it be good for marketing, UI? What is your opinion? So I was just uh, trying to unmute myself. Um, definitely UI, definitely marketing. I think it's, you know, I think as a, as a methodology, it can be developed to fit a number of different um, of different content types. So, in fact, you know, going back to the concept of source, you know, what uh, Jérôme was saying, a source is a start, is a starting point, right? Is the information you need to be able, as a translator, to produce something that sounds native in your language. Who says that that should be a finished sentence in another language, as opposed to an information? Yeah, think journalists you know, translate source free all the time. You know, they write source free. It's it's not, this is not new, it's just the way it gets applied to different content types that that would change as a methodology. It could even be, I'm thinking like a, like a running text, like a blog post. Now we haven't tried that yet, but as opposed to just giving a blog article uh, to a translator and say, translate it. it it's, it's almost never gonna be relevant to the other audience just as translated. But if you give them key points 
you know, just boil that down into a list of bullet points and then it's going to give them the information they need to research and write an adapted version of it. Um, and to go back to your question around what percentage of content, um, I, machine translation is pretty new at Manis because I've been going against that stream and trend for a long time uh, now. But I'm, I'm appreciating uh, its benefits now because it's giving me, it's freeing some of the time for doing more important stuff that actually brings home the money. <laughs> and I think um, in an ideal world, uh, you could machine translate 90% of your content and then use source free on the 10% of con content that truly converts. Okay, fantastic. Um, okay, and uh, one more question for Gosha from me. So, ha Gosha, how, how did you stumble upon this idea and, and how did you come, come about to do the research? Um, well, at the end of last year, I found out that uh, Lockwood uh, conference uh, in, in 2020 will be on engaging global users. And I thought that uh, having um, such a project in the portfolio and uh, I, I have to localize it on this one compose um, would be a good thing to, to present there. Uh, so I decided to submit uh, my presentation. And at the beginning, I actually wanted to talk about the, this uh, user interface challenge. Uh, I, I talked about it at the beginning of my presentation. Uh, but then uh, Yuka Kurihara, the former manager of our team, um, she uh, told me about Julia's approach and uh, it was actually the first time I heard about it and I was uh, really astonished by this idea and I was very eager to start the uh, research. So uh, yeah, th that's how it started and um, actually in one month on the on July 30th I will be a presenter on Lock Worldwide which is an online event and uh, I will talk uh, a bit more about my findings and uh, mm -hmm. yeah. excellent yeah we're looking forward to it uh, all right and I know that we had a lot of a lot more questions and so I will hand it over to Priscilla now and we'll try to answer as many as we can that uh, popped out during uh, the webinar. So Priscilla over to you. Thanks Dominica uh, and thanks to all of you for uh, fantastic presentations. Uh, so we do have a lot of questions today and uh, and obviously uh, we'll endeavor to answer as many as we can uh, but uh, after the webinar we'll, uh, we'll make sure to answer all of them if we haven't answered yours today. Uh, so uh, I have a question for Julia. Julia are you doing uh, uh, no, I think uh, I've asked uh, Dominica you've already asked this question are you doing agile continuous localization? I'm going to ask you another one uh, to Malgar, Zata and Julia. How do you justify the cost saving uh, from TM compared to using this new approach? Does the hour spent on to translate a string without source is justifiable? Uh, Gosha, do you want to go first? I think you have more experience, so please uh, um. Um, answer this one. Yeah. So I think um, you know how do how do you measure the um, efficacy of this? I think Gosha's uh, analysis in and what she did with the data is is fantastic. This is definitely the next steps. Uh, you know to understand how whether source free and whether a translation in general is good in its own right. And this is something that the industry has tried to do with, you know, the blue score metrics and, and, and all other things that were pointless in in regards to user experience, at least, which is what uh, I've always had, um, you know, as, as my as my main goal. Um, ultimately, a translation is only effective, you know, if, if you're an app, if it converts, if it doesn't convert, you could have spent zero on it, but then 10 minutes prepping a brief, it's already too much. So ultimately, I think you know it's it's conversion that's going to tell it's the, it, that 
whether something is 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 working or not so if the benefit, you know, if the conversion increase is substantial, you know, however you want to define substantial, depending on how that is converting in general, the original was converting, uh, you know, it's it's worth it. In, if I don't think it costs that much more money uh, once you've understood how to do it at scale. Um, and, and, and as I said, court is a translation is, is already too expensive because people can machine translate apps at a touch of a button, there's no point in providing a straightforward translation anymore. So it's all down to answering the user's needs. And, you know, in order to do that, you need to go with something that truly speaks to the audience, no matter how little or much it has cost within a certain framework, of course, that's justifiable. And you can also add that doing the right thing from the start costs less, even if it's more expensive. By that, I mean, if you release a product that's not be A-B tested, for instance, that doesn't go through in-country review, you just publish the product. If it's a SaaS product in continuous delivery, that can happen. Um, if the customers come back to you, or if there are more calls to tech support because the button is poorly translated, then it ends up with more time spent by the company on something, and then you have to fix it. So you need to create a bug in Jira or whatever system you're using, assign it to an engineer, test it, doing regression testing, apply it, create a build, re release the build. That's a lot of time, a lot of time, instead of spending maybe three more, well, well three, three times as much as it would cost with normal translation. Well, in the end, you get good user experience, which in return gives you more money and less cost. So it's an investment think, in a sense. Yeah, I think this is spot on. You know, it's 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 about you know if you think as a as, as a localization specialist within a company, how many touch points you have. You know, what Jerome mentioned, like customer customer support, for example, or t technical support. This is huge. Like if you could save ten thousand calls a month because you've localized a button properly. Would you not do that? Like, uh, you know, it's 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 a no-brainer. But of course, if you do it right from the start, then you don't even have to go down the path of redoing something. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for your answers. And um, now I have a, a question for Malgar Zata. Who owns the creation of the functional descriptions? Uh, is it the UX design team or someone in the localization team? Uh, the descriptions prepared for translations, uh, you mean? Um, it, it was prepared by me, um, just uh, without taking any um, ideas from any source. So that, that was uh, just prepared by me with uh, feedback from my colleagues from the globalization team. Mm -hmm. That answers the question. Yeah, I think uh, Julia managed to streamline that process of preparing the, you know, those copywriting briefs uh, for translators as well. So I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit more. How how to, you know, make the make this process truly agile? Because as you said, uh, it's I think it's this buy-in uh, in the beginning from everyone that is crucial and how to prove to them that you can scale it and you can have agile continuous localization. Yeah, so I think it's important to make sure that you you know you work within the framework of the existing SLAs or delivery times that you you have normally uh, to prove that this can work because you know they're all worried about releasing, you know, with no delays and whatnot. Um, localization, you know, current it, in in the beginning of this approach, it needs to be the localization team who takes the, you know, on, on their shoulders the duty of and the task of creating the briefs, because it's you who understand what translators struggle with, and what they need to know. But then ultimately it can be passed on to designers. So as you formalize it, 
and bootstrap it more and, and make it very templatized. So it's easy, you know, it's an over, it's a title, it starts with title and then uh, you know, giving a precise indication of what's expected to the user. Ultimately, designers can take over this task. And some designers say, I need to see my design with the finalized or sort of with a, with a draft of English copy in to be able to understand if my design is correct. And that's perfectly fine. But what's the step before that? You know, there is a step before. It just doesn't get captured in writing. But that's the step. And it, why, why can it not? You know, and then actually designers you know, will find comfort in this because they can produce their design. And then they, they know exactly what's the function of each text within the screen. That's what you access down to. That's what they're trying to build. You know, to make sure that they can focus, you know, on 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 one or a set of actions um, that the user needs to to do on that screen. So they're in fact best placed to write these designs. And if they produce their designs with this copy on it, it means that also the English copywriter will not be caged to say, you know, to put it like Gosha, in 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 what they can produce is so much better than what they would if they just got this design with the copy written by the designer who's not a copywriter and just thought, I'm just gonna remove a couple of typos or I'm just gonna finesse it a little bit. But ultimately the idea is there. You know, the idea is what the design wants the user to do within the screen. So if you can write it down in a way that's not the finalized copy, even the copywriter will benefit. Sorry, I'm not sure if that answered your question, but um, yeah, ultimately I, localization yeah. and then design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I don't know, Priscilla, uh, do you have any uh, other questions right now? I know that we're coming on to an hour. <laughs> Yes, we actually have a lot of questions, uh, I mean, uh, obviously, uh, but uh, I think um, we won't be able to answer all of them. Obviously, you know, we'll, uh, we'll endeavor to answer each and every one of them uh, after the webinar. Uh, we have uh, one last question today uh, uh, for uh, Jerome. And uh, uh, what advice would you give to start implementing these processes uh, in a company without someone dedicated to product localization? Well, I think Julia just said, who would be the best place person to do this? And it's it's actually actually UX. If you have a UX department, people would be best place to do this. This is this is what I would do if if we didn't have a globalization team like Gosha. And 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 I still think that to some extent we still need even the developers on it because some products are easy to understand and you just well if it's UX is really really well made. You, you don't need to ask them about what this is about. However, for complex products, you need to go to developers. You need to go to the people who actually design the product. So I would say it's a mix of, and also whoever is able uh, to, to provide some context on it. I mean, any voice can help doing that. Excellent. Thanks, Lorraine again, sorry. Yeah. Thank you all so much uh, for sharing your presentations and answering questions. Uh, it was lovely <laughs> to have you at this webinar, and I'm sure that uh, with the amount of ideas and you know food for thought that we got, we could easily go to another one just with Q and A. <laughs> I bet uh, we will, as uh, Priscilla mentioned, strive to answer all the questions that you have. We'll keep the Slido event open uh, for you so that um, you know you can get in touch with us. Uh, but without further ado, thank you so much for spending the last hour or so with us. Thank you to everyone. Thanks, uh, Dominique. Uh, uh, thanks for those fantastic presentations. Um, so as, as Dominique mentioned, uh, if we didn't get an opportunity to answer your question today, of course, uh, we will after this webinar. Uh, the recording uh, will be sent out to you uh, by email uh, very shortly, and the Slido platform will be kept open uh, for a few more days. Uh, so if you want to go back and listen to this webinar, uh, the recording will be available uh, 
in coming days on the visiting.com website and uh, the GoTo stage uh, platform. So thanks again uh, to Julia, Mel Brazata, Jerome and Dominique for a fantastic, very insightful discussion. And thank you everybody. This webinar has now come to a close. Thank you. All right.